Welcome to the Cannabis 101 podcast, your guide through the legalization and consumption of cannabis in Canada and beyond. Here's your host, Dean Millard. Hello there and welcome to episode 72, hour one of the Cannabis 101 podcast. My name is Dean Millard. And if you're watching us on YouTube or our social media feeds, you will see the view that I have, a winter wonderland here uh, just outside of Edmonton. And uh, hey, you got to make the best of winter when you can. Welcome to the show. My name is Dean Millard. As mentioned, this is episode 72, hour one. And uh, it's not just about getting high. It's about getting healthy on this program. And that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, all the time, we're going to try to educate you about how you can be healthier and have a healthy relationship uh, with cannabis. But there is certainly one way that we try to kick things off on this program, and that's finding out what's your groove. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Can you dig it? This is great. This is the bee's knees. So when I say what's your groove, I'm I'm asking what if anything you are grooving with grooving with rather while you're listening to this show, uh, maybe you've rolled a joint. Who knows? Uh, maybe you've just got some nice calming CBD. Maybe you got your bong going. Pipe and a crepe, bong and a blintz. I'm not sure. It all uh, depends on, you know, how grooving you want to get. Uh, this is how I'm grooving on this one. There we go. I had to uh, turn off the uh, double talk there, the echo that was going on, Uh, but this is what uh, I am grooving with on this episode. Uh, I'm going with some uh, Goji Oji from Quest, and this is the coolest thing, is that ashtray was actually given to me this weekend uh, by my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. It's a 67-year-old ashtray. If I uh, tilt it up here a little bit and you can see it, it's from Transit Tire. Uh, There's no area codes on the telephones. So it's a very cool ashtray and very nice gesture. Um, You know, my father-in-law is uh, from a generation that maybe doesn't know as much about cannabis, but still a very nice gesture uh, by him uh, to give me this uh, cool birthday present. So you saw the Regal Cigars there. I've got a Regal Slim that I've packed with Goji Oji. Uh, Andre from Regal Cigars is going to be appearing on this show next week so i'm really excited about that so let me get my groove on awesome regal slims and a great ashtray as well so cool so there you go the uh goji oji in a uh, sweet regal slim uh for that's my groove anyway uh, again, uh, let me know what your groove is. If you're grooving with something, hit me up and let me know. We'll give you the uh, details as we go. And of course, the Cannabis 101 podcast is presented by Stonesmiths. Have you seen The Slash? Check it out at stonesmiths.ca. Uh, this thing is just absolutely incredible. It has a uh, a built-in loader, and it also has a battery built for Edmonton winters. Uh, I've had this out on a couple of walks that I've gone with. It is absolutely awesome. So you can pick this up at uh, Shell Shock in Edmonton. 
You can also find it at Smokers Junction in Calgary and Cowboy Smoke Shop in uh, Calgary and Vancouver. It's just uh, amazing, amazing uh, for concentrates. We're going to tell you about it as we go along uh, the program. We'll tell you about some of the cool features of this great Edmonton company. But here's what's coming down the hash pipe on this show today. David Wiley from the OZ, as usual, for This Week in Cannabis News. We are going to discuss uh, some cannabis research going on around the world, how medical cannabis is getting a lot easier for some patients, thanks to one company. We will recap what happened in the U.S. election and AFRIA looking down south as well. As for Mac LaBelle on the business of cannabis, we will also discuss uh, some impacts from the U.S. election in Canada and in the U.S. and, and how that will be impacted. Uh, the post-election hype. Uh, we're going to talk about hemp-based products and game changers and in what it means to be green. There is not enough green when it comes to COVID numbers. We'll have our cannabis question, which is about family members. Our weed word of the day is about extracts today. And we'll tell you about the weed weekly uh, that you can get in on every single week and stay in touch with the Cannabis 101 podcast. All right, let's get into the cannabis question now. It's prize time. <laughs> Chime in on the cannabis question. Okay. And you could win a Cannabis 101 podcast prize pack. Pipe and a grape, bong and a blint. Hit us up on any of our social media feeds or email us at Cannabis101podcast at gmail.com. Okay, here we go. So the cannabis question I'm asking you today is, what family member of yours would you most like to get high with? If there is a family member that you were like, man, I really would like to get high with this person, or just turn them on to cannabis and, and, and you know maybe even get them involved in CBD or some of the other uh, cannabinoids out there that we're learning about. Uh, for me, uh, I'm, going, I'm going with my wife, first of all, uh, Trish Millard who uh, I, th I think could get have a lot of benefits uh, from uh, the cannabis plant for sure. Um, so, so I think health-wise and recreational-wise, uh, cannabis could be great for everybody, uh, but particularly my wife, uh, who is, uh, you know, she's battled the big C twice, and uh, if it ever comes back, there will be cannabis involved in the treatment for sure. My dad is one guy that not necessarily... Uh, think he would enjoy getting high but i think he could just really benefit uh from cbd but i, I would love to get uh, high with him and watch him giggle and and my my oldest brother uh derek um we call him straight lace i call him straight lace ace i don't even know if i've ever seen him drunk but he's in the canadian military so obviously uh cannabis has not been legal and it's and it's uh i think it's off limits uh not 100 percent sure there uh but i would love uh to uh Give him a nice blue dream joint and see what happens. Maybe when he retires, we'll see. So anyway, chime in um, with who you think you would like uh, to get high with. It is our cannabis question today, and you can get in touch with us in a number of different ways. On Twitter, at the Cannabis 101. You can get us, the Cannabis 101 podcast, on Instagram and Facebook. And you can also get us uh, through email, Cannabis101podcast at gmail.com. That is Cannabis101podcast at gmail.com. You can be anonymous, and we can still make you a winner. And just for chiming in, everybody's going to get a shot at a Regal cigar. There, you're looking at a couple of them there if you're watching us. Beautiful stuff. Andre will be joining us from a Regal cigar next week. So looking forward to finding out the backstory on that. All right, the Weed Weekly comes out every Friday. It recaps the show. We also have a giveaway. There's so much fun. There's some other things in it as well. It just gives you an op a chance to stay up to date with the Cannabis 101 podcast presented by Stone Smiths. And it's a lot of fun as well. I try to work in some different things. And I love the feedback that I get uh, from uh, listeners at uh, different times. Okay, so that's the Weed Weekly. You can get that at the Cannabis101podcast.ca. Just head there, click subscribe, and you're in the mix. We will do a giveaway every week, but it only is for 
subscribers. So get in the mix at the cannabis one one podcast.ca and you could be winning the weed weekly. What's happening? We'll tell you right now on this week in cannabis news. My good friend David Wiley from the OZ joining me as usual on This Week in Cannabis News. You can follow them on Twitter at Okanagan Z and check them out online at OkanaganZ.com. David, I greet you and those watching with my view right now as I uh, record this with you. A beautiful winter wonderland uh, in uh, St. Albert, Alberta. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm sure yours is not quite as white and not quite as much, but uh, how are things nonetheless? It's not quite as snowy here, but where's the snowman? I want to see the snowman. <laughs> yeah, we, we, did, uh, we did get some snow angels done over the weekend, but we have yet to get out and build a snowman. It's, not, it's still a little bit too fluffy for that snowman. You have to have that perfect snowman consistency or else it doesn't. But snow angel consistency, it is absolutely <laughs> perfect for. So uh, I, I'm the type of person that thinks that, uh, you know what, if it's, we know winter is here now. It's here for likely the next five, six months. We might as well try to make the best of it. Not to saying I won't be complaining when it gets down to the minus 35, minus 40, minus 50 a little bit. But for right now, I'm going to try to uh, in- enjoy it as well. And, and I think that's how you have to get through winter in Canada. We're allowed to complain. It's a rite of passage, really. Yes, yes, it is indeed. All right, let's get on to our uh, first story. And this is an interesting story. Uh, you and I have talked a lot about how it's great that we can go buy a joint and smoke it at home and nobody's calling the cops. So we can grow our four plants indoors uh, in most places and uh, nobody's calling the cops, etc. But the research that is being done and will be done on the plant, I think, is the biggest boom and going to be the greatest thing about legalization and now we're seeing it around the world and uh particularly in the netherlands with this story it's great to see this research we try and talk about it every week it feels like and i love it in this case dutch researchers uh and a swiss cannabis company are testing um natural alternatives as they call it to solving sleep problems and those natural alternative uh, alternatives, of course, are cannabis. And now trouble sleeping really is a, an all too common affliction. Uh, in, in this study, the researchers say that it's 30% of people in the Netherlands that are affected. And this new sud- study is expected to glean some insight into the potential benefit of cannabis when it comes to sleep. And, you know, improving the total amount of sleep and sleep quality, it it really reduces a long list of health problems. So it's a cornerstone to good health. Uh, This is going to be a large double blinded randomized placebo controlled crossover study. I just love that description (laughs) shows how thorough they're going to be. Uh, And it's going to include more than 300 people in the Netherlands who are using cannabis products made by a Swiss company. And what they're hoping to find out is whether cannabinoids could be a potential solution. Uh, these researchers that are attached to the University of Groningen in the Netherlands say that they believe that the full spectrum CBD and CBN products can have a calming and sedating effect on the central nervous system. Uh, now, someone who sleeps on average of less than six hours per night actually has a 13% higher mortality rate than someone who's sleeping between seven and nine hours. And that's because a lack of sleep uh, creates an increased risk for diabetes, obesity, hypertension, coronary heart heart disease, stroke, mental disorders uh, that include anxiety and depression. So uh, hopeful that cannabis can be a helpful solution to, uh, you know, affording people a good night's sleep. Well, I, I I will just tell you from my own personal experience, and of course this is anecdotal. I I don't have a large research uh, R and D at the uh, Cannabis One Hundred and One podcast, but I will tell you <laughs> that my life dramatically improved when I figured out my sleep. That a I had sleep apnea. Uh, I, I purchased a CPAP machine. I used it properly. And then I'm getting this eight hours of uh, sleep. Like I used to actually, I would be the opposite. I would sleep 12 hours and it would be terrible sleep and I would be sluggish. 
I got my sleep figured out, and I, I'm not joking. It is the foundation of uh, my mental health. If I have a bad sleep, it's going to likely lead to a bad day. So I can concur with a whole lot of this study, and, and but I di- did not realize that a lack of sleep also led to so many other things. So, you know, wh- when people talk about getting your eight hours, they're not. Ju- it's not just lip service, right? It actually does uh, improve or, you know, prevent a lot of things with your health. It really does. And I'm in the same boat. I've you know, suffered off and on um, with sleep problems, uh, with insomnia in particular. Uh, when it comes down to it, it's there's not only a health case to be made here, but uh, when it comes to research, I mean, those who are funding it and the nations who are providing the platform um, usually want some kind of an economic case as well. And right here, this actually does afford that. Well, when it comes to proper sleep, that will actually improve a country's GDP. So addressing sleep deprivation with people reduces health and work-related costs dramatically. So we'll see that as well. And not to say that that's, of course, our first concern. Uh, My first concern, as well as hopefully most people, is for that of their uh, friends and family and uh, our fellow human beings. When it comes to economic benefit, well, that's just gravy on the mashed potatoes. Yeah, and that's, you know what that is? That's a way to get corporate to buy into it, be like, oh, wow, the the production is going to increase? Well, they're doing it for one reason, but it's going to lead to, uh, you know, healthier people. And, you know, that's why you see some places that are really forward thinking, you know, have nap areas and things like that for their employees because the productivity is, uh, is improved in those situations when you are getting either proper sleep or, you know, taking those power naps. I don't know about you, but power naps they they really are what they are they 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 give me an absolute boost when i can get them in you know working from home i have my own napping area so yeah. that's perfect <laughs> that is awesome so yeah exactly we're uh, we're on the uh, the forward curve with that okay so i talked about you know sleep being something that uh, you know i could uh, I guess, uh, uh, identify with this next story is certainly something I think you can identify with is that, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to do to get medical cannabis. And, and I really like this story from the OZ, uh, especially when you look at, you know, how legalization came to be, uh, it owes a lot to the medicinal world, doesn't it? Yeah, it absolutely does. And I've gone through it firsthand, like you alluded to medical cannabis is a pain to access. Uh, There are people, thankfully, who are making it easier on patients, and I talked to a couple of them, Joel Taylor being one, and he founded a company called Patient Choice, and that basically gives medical cannabis patients the freedom to purchase from a wider range of providers and hopefully creating a more competitive competitively priced environment on one platform. Right now, one of the challenges is that as a medical cannabis patient, you have to pick your LP and changing that after choosing them is very difficult. You only have access to one type of product. And once you're on your your LP's website, there's no competition on there. So that's a challenge. Right now, Patient Choice does have a few different partnerships that they're trying to increase. They've got uh, the Green, Green Organic Dutchman, Tantalus, G-Tech, which produces uh, um, cannabis out of companies like Black Market. And uh, basically, Joel said that it can medical cannabis needs to be much more accessible to Canadians. Uh, you know that hopefully his company can provide a little bit of disruption, a little bit of shakeup um, so that people see that it doesn't have to be the way that it is. And he says that if it weren't for medical cannabis patients, there would be no recreational market. They really are the trailblazers and they were a, a voice shouting in the wilderness when recreational cannabis was only a dream. Um, Another company that I talked to that's trying to fill the gap when it comes to doctors who are very leery with prescribing cannabis uh, is the CEO and founder of a company called the Reformulary Group. Her name is Helen Stevenson, and she's created something called the Cannabis Standard Index. It goes alongside a model that the company created for pharmaceutical drugs called Drug Finder. And What it does is it tries to bring information about different strains and not just any information, but information that is very um, scientifically verified and that is also looked at by physicians. 
So the idea here is that if you show doctors and you show patients that there is uh, scientific backing that certain strains, certain types of cannabis products can help conditions, then they'll be more willing to buy into that. Uh, so hats off to any company that's out there that's trying to make access easier and that's trying to help convince doctors that medical cannabis is a thing and it is helping patients. Yeah, and uh, you know, as you point out in this article, it's uh, the 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 doctors. It's not made easy for the doctors to be involved in this. A lot of times, doctors they're not going to make a decision until they're told they're allowed to or told to. They a lot of them play it right by the book, and you know, I'm I'm not a doctor, so I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, particularly legal, um, but. This hopefully will be changing uh, and hopefully more open-minded doctors will be looking into this. And it, it's quite clear, uh, you provide some numbers uh, for, for a, from a survey in this article, and it's quite clear that Canadians are saying, listen, we, we need more than what you're giving us, and we don't want that 30% charge up front. Yeah, 30%, uh, you know, going into the pockets of different companies that are choosing LPs to, um, you know, supply cannabis. This poll by Research Co. found that the vast majority of medical cannabis patients are feeling like they're taken advantage of. 72% of Canadians, 82% of medical patients agree that physicians who prescribe medical cannabis should give their patients a choice of suppliers and products and we've seen with all kinds of other industries that when you give people a choice of the product that they're going to uh, consume to purchase really to vote with their dollars it lowers price and it increases quality in so many different ways no doubt all right so the u.s election um i think has come and gone but uh, i don't know it was just <laughs> such a wild week and and if this isn't peak 2020, I don't know what is. But during all of this gong show, the fact that medical and legal and recreational cannabis was the biggest winner, you know, was was so overshadowed. Like when in the past 40 years would so much legalization of cannabis kind of be a blip on the radar? Well, because of what's going on, everything around this. But if you got so caught up in, you know, Biden and Harris and, and everything that Trump was going on and you missed the news about cannabis, it was really the big winner in, on election night. It's amazing how progressive the U.S. is in yeah. certain areas. And yeah, like you said, the big winners on election night in the U.S. were, well, cannabis, psychedelics, and overall the decriminalization of all drugs, if you could believe that. So New, New Jersey, let's start there. They're set to become one of the biggest cannabis markets in the U.S. Mm -hmm. after, legalizing, after legalizing recreational weed. And that's with about 65% of New Jersey voters in favor of that constitutional amendment. So that's really going to raise the stakes according to people who are watching these decisions closely in the neighboring states like New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, also Arizona, Montana, South Dakota, all approved recreational cannabis in their own referendums. So that makes it now 15 states that are legalized uh, adult recreational use and in Mississippi, Montana, and South Dakota, they've legalized medical cannabis also. Uh, I'd say that the most historic decision of the night has to go to Oregonians. And they passed what is one of the most significant drug policy changes ever in the United States. Our voters there approved a ballot initiative to decriminalize possession of all drugs. So what that <laughs> will do is it will remove criminal penalties for low-level drug possession offenses. That's a first in the U.S., and rather, there will be a $100 fine levied, or the person could be required to complete a health assessment. Uh, also, on, on election night in Washington, D.C., voters passed Initiative 81, and that decriminalizes a wide range of psychedelic plants, including magic mushrooms. So that measure is going to make the, prose the prosecution of all who use them uh, basically among the police forces force their lowest law enforcement priorities. So some amazing changes happening in the U.S. right now. It really is. And, and and it's really interesting. I don't know if, you know, this is the cause or it's just coincidence, but 
I have started receiving a lot more correspondence and people reaching out from the United States. Uh, and, and one person in particular was from Pennsylvania. And, and I said, hey, just, just wait, uh, because the dominoes are starting to follow. And I think what you were talking about with New Jersey, you know, now you've got New York knocking on the door and, and a, so many close states that are going to be like, oh, my goodness, look at the tax money, that look at the revenue, look at the jobs that is being created the dominoes are going to start falling in that particular area and that is a massive well, you know you get new york that's it's huge man it's huge if that happens and and that's what i told this person i said just just be patient because it's going to start happening now it'll be interesting to see what happens you know federally when everything gets settled with with biden harris and their decriminalization plan and how long after that it leads to legalization but you can start to seeing everything tipping in the, the wheel of cannabis legal cannabis is really starting to turn isn't it yeah yeah absolutely and when you think about decriminalization versus legalization when you're legalizing uh, you're creating a form of tax revenue if you've decriminalized then really none of that money goes into the to, into the different governmental coffers and coming in from covid right now where really economies are suffering so deeply when you introduce something like a brand new industry that you could tax a multi-billion dollar industry that's going to help lift up economies quite a bit uh, as far as prohibition of alcohol way back in the 30s uh, i mean the big change there was the great depression right. and governments realized that they needed another source of revenue and here we are in a very similar situation right now where you have economies that are really suffering and uh, cannabis is knock knock knocking on the door that's for sure Okay, and, and this last story that we have kind of dovetails on that and to, to yeah. what we've been talking about a lot is that there are a lot of companies in Canada that are just waiting for the laws to change in a lot of places and, and, and you know, they're, they're, the, the deals are starting to come out and this is the one we're talking about right now with, uh, with AFRIA and this is, a, this is a pretty big deal. It's a cool one. It's interesting to see because it's it's not only a Canadian company that's moving into the U.S., but it's also showing a further trend, which is uh, you know the the disruption of drinks, cannabis drinks in particular. Uh, Afria believes that Sweetwater Brewing Company is going to be its entry point to the U.S. and the cornerstone of its longer term strategy in the states. This is an Ontario-based cannabis company, and they announced this acquisition last week. Now, uh, cannabis drinks really are already a big disruptor. We've seen a lot of different studies and white papers and reports, you know, different people saying that, that these drinks are going to uh, take a chunk of the alcohol market, that they're going to be something that's really an entry point for new cannabis consumers. And AFRI here is really tapping into that. This is going to help them establish infrastructure in the U.S., um, that's as federal legalization is really looming ever closer and it's going to give them access to Sweetwater's portfolio of beer brands and that includes its 420 series that really plays into the the cannabis branding uh, they have offerings like Jack Harrer Harvest Ale and Trainwreck Hazy Double IPA I wish that we could see drinks like that in Canada right now there uh, the legislation does prevent any crossover between alcohol and cannabis so generally companies are uh, a little bit shy of dubbing their drinks ale or ipas uh, but i think that will change as things loosen and this purchase here is worth about 300 million dollars us has already been unanimously approved by AFRIA's board. Uh, the deal is expected to close before the end of December 2020, and it's really going to be a game changer. Uh, Sweetwater's based in Atlanta, Georgia. They're one of the biggest independent craft brewers in the United States. Uh, they have established distribution across 27 states plus Washington, D.C., uh, and their beverages are available in 29,000 off-premises retail locations and more than 10,000 restaurants that's a that's an extreme access to a market across the u.s so this will be interesting to see how it plays out and how uh, it increases afria's footprint in the u.s yeah the uh, this is really interesting because I, I went on their website and and it seems like all of their drinks do have an alcohol percentage and as you mentioned the regulations are 
that you can't combine an alcoholic beverage with cannabis, which I actually think is smart. Um, I, I, w- I hope that we get these types of drinks with non-alcoholic versions that we can combine cannabis into, into with our country, in, in our country. It's, as you know from looking at the U.S., it's a wild west down there, and you could pretty much, you know, you could buy, you can get sunglasses and CBD at a mall kiosk as you're walking down to get some new sandals in Vegas. So there's not as much uh, restrictions, uh, obviously, and and I think that will ha- change if uh, if it certainly if it ever goes federally. But I'd like to see the taste of these drinks infused with cannabis, not the alcohol portion. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I'm the same. I'm not, I was a little bit confused going on their website, wondering mm-hmm. whether or not some of these drinks did have uh, both cannabis and alcohol in them. It seems like the ones like the Jack Harrow drink and the train wreck one uh, only had cannabis and they didn't seem to have an ABV on the can that I could okay, see, g- um, but their 420 series, which seems to be you know, basically alcohol, but yet appealing and name to the cannabis market um, did a little bit. So it's like you said, it is a little bit wild west when it comes to regulations here in Canada, we're a bit more stringent. And like we talked about last week, as the U S really marches toward federal legalization or some form of legalization across states that Canada will have to get more competitive in its regulations to keep up with the U S. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, uh, the, the whatever meter race you want to pick has started. Uh, Canada is like, you know, out by this giant lead, but then all of a sudden this America is going to fly by us if we're not careful. And, and, you know, that's going to, mm-hmm. that's going to mean relaxing some of the regulations. And I'm not saying that, uh, you, you know, we're going to start selling cannabis in a max convenience store, but it's going to be have to be some regulation. relaxing of in order for these companies to be able to compete uh, with or or we're going to lose the competitive advantage that we should have had for two years now yeah i you know i I think that one of the big winners when um we see federal legalization in the u.s is actually going to be our friend seth rogan because Mm -hmm. those house plant drinks when they get into the u.s market i think they're just going to take off yeah. Um, he has such a big fan base there and Canopy is so well positioned when it comes to its uh, impending deal with Acreage. All right, David, before I leave you, uh, I want to give you one more look at our uh, winter wonderland that we have here. And because we have such a winter wonderland, I'm hoping you can help me out a little bit. Uh, I'd be happy to. I have these uh, special OZ toques right here. Beautiful. It's uh, quite quite popular among our readers and i just want to give your listeners a chance to to get in on one of those Uh, every thursday in november we are giving away a toque to a reader to a listener Uh, all you have to do is email us hello at okanaganz.com let us know what uh, you're enjoying right now what you're smoking what you're drinking uh, what kind of chocolate you're eating whatever (laughs) we'd love to hear Uh, so it's hello at okanaganz.com and uh, we'll put your name in the hat every Thursday. We're going to draw it uh, live on Instagram and announce the winner Thursday and Friday in the newsletter. All right. Well, maybe the next time we, we chat, oh, there'll be a snowman and some snow angels, and I'll be out there, or somebody will be out there wearing one of those toques because we're, we're obviously going to need it here in Alberta. So awesome stuff. Thanks so much for joining me. I look forward to uh, – I'm going to try to win one of those toques, uh, that's for sure, so I can get out in the winter wonderland uh, with the OZ. Thanks, as always, David. Thanks, Dean. guide through the legalization and consumption of cannabis in Canada and beyond. I want to remind you that the Cannabis and Hemp Expo uh, will be scheduled late April at the Edmonton Expo Centre. By the way, that was the weed song from the artist My Dead Dog. Uh, you'll hear another ditty from him 
at the end of the show, as he is our extra with the marijuana song. So the Cannabis and Hemp Expo, late April uh, 24th, 25th of 2021. Get the details at CannabisHempExpo.com. We'll be there. We'll have a booth. I'd love for you to come say hi. We'll be uh, preparing some episodes. So please, please come down and say hello and uh, keep it locked on this podcast as we will uh, be having some tickets to give away as we get closer to the date. April 24th and 25th at the Edmonton Expo Center. This is the Business of Cannabis, a joint venture between the Green Generation Co. and the Cannabis 101 podcast. Bringing you the latest bud, biz, buzz. Malka LaBelle of the Green Generation Co. joining me on the Business of Cannabis. Find out how Malka can help you at www.greengencompany.com. And uh, Malka, uh, before we get started, I just thought I'd give you a look at what my office view is. Oh. I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, Southern Alberta <laughs> isn't a whole lot different, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to embrace winter this year. So uh, looking at it and then going out and making snow angels is how I'll do that. Yeah, we had that storm too. You know what? It was so windy, it didn't stick. Oh, <laughs> so wh- it's really sunny. It's cold, but it definitely snowed. But it was too windy for it to stick. Well, this is uh, one of the times where I'm very grateful. I live in a condo, and I do not have to shovel because all I saw on social media <laughs> were people shoveling over and over and over again. And and if you wait until it's stops snowing, the snow is so heavy, so you kind of have to do it. So I've been there before glad i'm not there now but uh, anyway let's get to our uh, lead topic on the business of cannabis and um we we've talked a lot about heading into the u.s election what kind of impact and through all the gong show that has been the u.s election and still is the one thing that was the biggest winner was cannabis a hundred percent um so the stat that i got uh, today was that now four more states were legalized uh uh, that was arizona new jersey south dakota and montana but now one in three american citizens live in the a legal recreational state so if you think about the population uh largely in california and and all of the states that are green um that's one third of americans live in a a legal rec state so that's huge i mean if you talk about you know tipping the tipping the point around what's you know what's really popular americans have said it they like cannabis um and they voted for it they voted for it uh directly through a plebiscite or on their ballot which means that what it was it wasn't uh you know, an election issue, it was on the ballot for them to vote on specifically. So that's a huge uh, vote for the cannabis sector um, and very important. But I think what more importantly out of all of this is is why, how does that impact us as Canadians and our, you know, our what was once thought of as really our true um, differentiator and our lead in legal cannabis uh, um, legalization. Um, I think what the, the key takeaways here are that this has really helped, you know, partly to end the stigma, but more primed um, the population of investment community uh, and for them to sort of sort of really pay attention and look at what are the differentiated, differentiated types of opportunities to invest in and, and where their um, you know particular investment proclivity lies, um, particularly for public companies. So now that we've seen sort of this whole, you know, cannabis had a a 1.0 with a massive boom on expectations and then a 2.0 with 2.0 coming out now we're really starting to see where the cards fall when it comes to publicly traded cannabis companies and many of the u.s companies are traded on canadian stock exchanges Mm. which means that they have to have a head office or have an office somewhere in canada whether on paper or whatever but what that means is that uh that's going to impact uh our own opportunity as a collecting taxes from those companies and giving more visibility um, from a public perspective on how these companies are operating so that's a huge good thing for canada but Mm -hmm. also makes it much more competitive so the canadian companies operating in the canadian space um are now sort of up against the operations and the 
profitability um, on the stock market against some of these larger, really now companies that are multi-state operators. So um, MSOs, I'm not sure if you've heard that term before, Dean, but the MSO is considered the multi-state operators. And it really is a result of, you know, how cannabis unroll unveiled in the US where each state chose to become legal mm -hmm. um, as opposed to in Canada where it's federally legal and then each province sort of just gets to uh, you know roll out the regulations but multi-state operators similar to how in Canada we have this patchwork of different types of regulations multi-state operators have had to figure out how to operate their business model in more than one jurisdiction with different rules applying so from a, a business standpoint what I like about this is that it's similar in Canada where everybody is sort of still a small guy. There is no such thing as like big companies that are doing a rollout across an entire country. Um, and it's really like almost from the ground up. And and this is benefit, this benefits Canada at sort of levels the playing field, I guess is the best way to describe it. That it, it really is uh, kind of interesting how that, that um, the, the, I guess the lead that we had, the two-year lead, as you and you kind of talked about uh, being competitive, could yeah. vanish very quickly. And I really hope this maybe forces Canada to take a look at themselves. Yeah, not only that, but it also primes Canadian companies for merger and acquisition activity. So we've talked mm -hmm. about this a little bit before on our last podcast. Um, so the Canadian companies are going to be looking pretty, trying to get pretty shiny up for their potential acquirement by U.S. companies or vice versa. So mm -hmm. this merger and acquisition uh, situation that's been happening across the board very rapidly, um, if people aren't paying attention and they're just sort of now tuning in that cannabis is something that they should invest in, they're kind of uh, behind the ball, but there's a lot of groups that are really trying to make this as clear as muddily possible um, in a new industry. But my bet is on the ancillary companies. And we've talked about these guys before. There's a lot of them. Um, we're both ancillary companies operating um, a sort of alongside the cannabis sector, talking about and sharing information, as well as collecting data from all of the um, companies that are either multi-state, multi-jurisdictional or you know cross-border. So we've talked before about Dutchy doing this, a lot of the, the data companies, a lot of the companies that I talk about that are running sort of software systems, they're not really a regulated good. They're still just a software company in a regulated industry. So for me, those are the ones to watch. Um, that's why where my attention goes is how are these companies tracking this information of new potential clients, prospects in all these different regions and what are the different landscape of regulation around it? Um, the other big thing is that, you know, with COVID kind of playing into this as being an accelerant to the industry, we're seeing this whole concept of vice um, vices and what is a vice category or vice investment category. So vices, I love the picture that the graphic there is funny, but it's, uh, you know, we're talking about gambling, you're talking about cannabis, talking about sex tech and the sex industry, as well as the tobacco gaming. Those are all, and alcohol obviously being the biggest one, those are all considered vice industries where, you know, when things are shitty and we're in the life and in the world of people, um, these types of, of industries and these products thrive. And my argument, and I talk about this in my blog, I have a lot of commentary around why cannabis is a good vice, where a vice tends to hurt you in the long term. It tends to be addictive. It tends to drain your bank account. And it tends to get you hooked on something that isn't really a good behavioral activity. But now the cannabis is becoming legal across, you know, North America. Um, the stigma and the the why it's bad for you argument is largely being talked about in the it's not real anymore. That the positive aspects of cannabis and the benefits that are coming out more and more, how it's healthier for you and than some of these other vices. It doesn't have the same kind of addictive qualities. You can still function, and it can actually be good for people in the long run to use cannabis as a protective of their own bodies in the face of such, um, you know, harsh things like COVID and other things. We haven't heard categorically, the research is still out yet, is uh, still to be determined. But what we're learning is that our bodies are primed to use cannabis for a long term. And that is a good thing. And more of that will come as more legalization and more research happens. Yeah, it, uh, it, it that certainly the best thing. And you know, Canadian companies getting involved has already happened. Uh, we talked about it on This Week in Cannabis News earlier that, uh, 
Afria has uh, purchased uh, Sweetwater Brewing, and so Canadian companies uh, were eyeing this up. Who we'll, we'll see once the election ever ends uh, what happens uh, with decriminalization and, and, and moving towards federally. But uh, right now, certainly going by state, uh, the Americans are gaining on this two-year lead that Canada has had. And it, it's going to take some work, and it's going to take Canada, uh, our company and our, our country, rather, and our, uh, our government to say, okay, do we want to be the leader of cannabis yeah. in the world? And, and it's going to, a decision is going to have to be made. Yeah, exactly. So we'll wait to see what changes are on our regulatory side. Side, I am involved in a lot of those policy conversations with industry and government, uh, and there are some roundtables happening for more engagement uh, on how how our government should change things. So that's actually starting right now in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned uh, and check that out if you're interested in, in learning more. You can definitely contact me for more information on on those discussions. All righty, let's uh, get to change makers now and uh, tell us what we're talking about when it comes to change makers and literally making a change out there when it comes to some products. Yeah, so this is sort of an interesting uh, play on letters and words. I think this is, I think this is really neat. So this company um, or this product is they're really focusing on hemp based packaging solutions. Um, they call themselves HWWH, and I believe it stands for Heal the World with Hemp uh, Packaging. And this is, a, I think, a Berta based company, and they're really trying to lean in to obliterate the boon of the plastics in the cannabis sector. Um, we know that the the cannabis packaging laws around what how a cannabis is contained has literally harmed the plant inside the package um, and really reduces the actual um, enjoyment of, you know, getting those terpene profiles and the, the, the LPs and the producers of cannabis have really been like scratching their heads on like, how do we get past this whole packaging situation? So this company is coming up with a solution to make packaging out of, um, I think, I believe it's um, cannabis waste products. So, you know, when you're producing cannabis and cultivation and processing, there is an amount that has to be disposed of for um, various reasons, and it can be consumed into the body, but it can be repurposed as a, as a pulp or a fiber that can be mixed with more hemp uh, fiber to make a sustainable actual packaged good. So we're talking about um, boxes and jars and containers where they're made from um, com uh, hemp and, and other waste uh, cannabis fibers that are demonstrably more sustainable than using, you know, native or, or raw forestry products. Um, and because they're hemp based, this is kind of creating a circular type economy. They're local, like they're in Alberta, I believe. And that means that they're making their products so that people in Alberta and the producers in Canada can use them from, you know, without having that carbon footprint of crossing an ocean. So that's really cool. Um, and I think they're working towards compostable containers as well. But for right now, some of the initial things that I've seen have been really neat and I can't wait to see what this company does. So um, this is my change maker for the week. Yeah, H or www.hwwhpackaging.com. Uh, I really like that. I, I love this concept and, uh, you know, I've, I've, our very second episode way back when on this show was all about hemp and the amount of products that we can make. And, and I still, I don't know why we just don't have giant hemp fields growing everywhere just for the benefit of the environment. And I don't know why hempcrete uh, isn't used more uh, when it comes to building products. Yeah, I'm working on that one too. I got some clients that are talking about that too. The, the hempcrete is a great conversation. We'll save that one for another day and I'll definitely bring some examples of what people are trying to do in that space. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, just the, the you know, we've, we've talked about hemp a few different times on the, in this segment and it's, uh, it's certainly well worth it. We also like to talk about what it means to be green. And in this case, uh, the headliner for this, uh, what it means to be green is a lack of green as an indicator is not a good thing. So tell us what you're chatting about here. Yeah, so this is this just came to my my site when you know we're watching the COVID maps and you know with all the <laughs> different parts of the country and the world and where COVID numbers are going up. Um, green generally means that things are getting better. So as in the case of this, this is a screenshot that's about this was a U.S. one, but the Canadian ones were equivalent. There has very been very little green left on the map, uh, which means that the COVID numbers, people infection rates are going up, not down. It's getting worse, not better. 
And that's what I was highlighting with what it means. Green usually means that things are good. And in this case, not so good. Um, even in Alberta, we're seeing more restrictions about, you know, having to stay home and not have people over. Um, but what I really wanted to touch on here was COVID is a symptom of a much larger societal problem. Um, COVID is literally a disease and it's a population control mechanism. I bring up um, our lovely friend over here, Thomas Malthus from like the 1890s. We've talked about him before. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that this is the, the subject matter comes up because in the 1890s, when he wrote his book, an essay on the principles of population, and I studied in him about him in you know, my social studies class in, in high school, what we were talking about at the time was how the basically these our entire planet is a living thing. Um, and as humans, we are not in control. <laughs> and and having COVID ri the re levels rise is not a problem that we get to fix. It is a problem that we have to essentially just deal with because the planet will tell us if we've got it right or not. And I know this is kind of ominous and seems very ethereal, but what I'm trying to say is that um, Thomas Malthus talked about three major hypotheses of how uh, populations control uh, exist. And war is a major one, famine and disease. And in, the, in 2020, we're dealing with the disease of COVID, which is essentially because of famine. And famine is as a result of climate change and migration of people in different regions moving to different parts of the world because they can't literally live where they were from because the temperatures are too high and there's no food for them to eat. These are examples of what are the steps that ha that sort of happen for population to be controlled. And that means population to decrease. So these are, I'm just highlighting that these is, this is kind of doom and gloomy, but there's a reason for this. COVID was not a man-made disaster. COVID is an example of the planet saying, back off people, You're, there's too many of you and I can't keep working as a planet for you all to live here at the same time. So that's what this is. This is the planet's sy uh, symptom of, of us saying that, you know, we've encroached on the, uh, the environment too much and we need to back up and back, backtrack. And we've already started seeing this with COVID is that, you know, population density of areas that were super high dense are, there's a lot more rural real estate being sold. Like the numbers of people buying houses in less dense areas is on the rise as a result, direct result of COVID. Um, so we're starting to see the population spread out, which is a good thing. That means that people can be maintained uh, in different places and not be so, you know, draining on the resources and climate of climate in the centers that are closest to oceans and other natural habitats. But, you know, how are we going to survive? What is it going to take for the human species to survive? It's not up to us. It's up to the planet to decide that. So I think vaccine is definitely a good way for us to be inoculated against COVID, but it's not the answer. It's only one part of the, the picture. But what it really means is becoming greener, being more respectful of our planet and treating our planet with way more respect than we treat ourselves. Because if the planet isn't healthy, then we're not going to exist anymore. So that's my dark yet ethereal way of talking about what it means to be green. Well, we saw, listen, we saw in the, in the very early stages of, uh, of COVID-19 and, and who knows if we'll see it again, the way it's trending. I'm, I'm not optimistic of, over the last little while that it's going to get a whole lot better. I hope it does. But we saw in the, in the kind of the early stages when, you know, the entire world shut down. Like you saw the Vegas strip empty. You saw animals coming <coughs> back to places where they, didn't uh you know normally in, encroach on i mean they were returning to yeah. and we saw you know we saw some of the smog going away so it, it's it, it's i don't know how you can deny the science anymore when the evidence was there of when the world basically <laughs> shut down the the, the earth got let, got healthier yeah and i think we need to pay attention to that a hell of a lot more yeah. um it's not being it's not being highlighted enough but this is what it means to be green this is why I, i'm doing what i'm doing um and that the 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 industrialization of our planet the cpg model all of those things are examples of where the money is what matters and it really has to the conversation has to change and i think we're now seeing that a lot more but it still has to we have to push even harder and that's that's what it's all about that's why i'm here the green generation company 
I'm with you on that one. Uh, a healthier planet is better for us and those that uh, will come after us. Melka, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I leave you with one more look at my uh, <laughs> view outside of my office here. Uh, check out www.greengencompany.com and find out how Melka can help you. Thanks as always, Melka. Thanks, Dean. Have a great week. This is the Cannabis 101 podcast, your guide through the legalization and consumption of cannabis in Canada and beyond. All right, I want to remind you that the Cannabis 101 podcast is presented by Stonesmiths. You can find out more information about the slash at stonesmiths.ca. Uh, it's got, uh, all you do with this is you uh, fire it up five times to uh, fire it up. There we go. And then when you want to hit it, just do the old four second hold. So you can hold it for four seconds uh, while it heats up. And then you take your hit. Uh, you got about another 12 seconds. To take your hit. And uh, they also have this uh, really cool feature here. As you can see, I will hold it up where you can hold all of your different products, six spots for your products. So they really did think of everything with uh, the slash. It also has three temperature settings as well and a uh, 12 second auto fire mode. You got everything. Uh, where can you find this? You can check it out at stonesmiths.ca. Also, Green Rock Cannabis, Edmonton, and their new location, Lethbridge. Uh, also, another one coming, or St. Albert, rather. Uh, they do have one coming in uh, Edmonton, but right now they have St. Albert and Lethbridge. Uh, you can find it at Uncle Ron's in Edmonton and Northern Light Supply in uh, Edmonton as well. So, the Slash, presented by, or presented by Stone Smiths, uh, as the presenting sponsor of the Cannabis 101 podcast. Let's get into Weed Word of the Day. Bud, dope, flower, ganja, Mary Jane. We all have our own language when it comes to cannabis. Herb, John Lennon, plant, tie stick, salad. So let's explore another Weed word of the day. Samuel O. Jack, the Hobbit's Leaf, Lady Gaga, 420. All right, we're talking extractions on weed word of the day. This is how it works. I try to give you one slang term that maybe you've heard but you're not familiar with and an industry term, a standard term. Uh, that is being used. So the, the slang is earwax today, and uh, it's a term for hash oil, and it's a potent concentrate. It has a very high amount of THC, uh, becomes waxing or waxy after the wh after whipping the product to give it that waxy texture. So if somebody says earwax, it's just uh, another concentrate, uh, but it is it's something you would use in the slash. So it's uh, perfect for that. If you want to get into dabbing and want to get into concentrates, the slash is the perfect way uh, to learn how to do it. And you don't have to bring out the torch and you can use some, uh, some earwax. Okay, how about CO2 extraction or carbon dioxide? Uh, a lot of producers believe CO2 as the most natural solvent to use when you're creating a uh, concentrate uh, through extraction. CO2 takes a super critical form and that makes controlling it easier and more accurate. So a lot of people love CO2 for the natural part to get the extraction. And then again, that is something that uh, you could throw in the slash or uh, dab however you want. But I would highly recommend, especially if you're new and you want to get into dabbing, uh, check it out. You will not at all be disappointed all right uh, just a few more things to get to and then we will wrap up the show this is the cannabis 101 podcast your guide through the legalization and consumption of cannabis in canada and beyond 
All right, that is just about going to wrap things up for us on the show. Uh, if you watched the program, thank you very much for checking out our YouTube channel or maybe it was on our social media feeds. Uh, but if you're listening and you'd like to see uh, the setup, especially when we do some of the stuff that we are talking about uh, with pictures, as we did with the Slash and Regal Cigars and what we do on What's That Strain, check out the YouTube channel, uh, Cannabis 101 Podcast. That uh, will also be streaming on our social media channels as well. And if you enjoyed the show, please let us know. Leave us a review, subscribe, or drop us a line. You can email us at Cannabis101Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, we want to thank our presenting sponsor, Stonesmiths, for being a part of the show. Find out more about the Slash at www.stonesmiths.ca. If you'd like to be a part of the program, please let me know. Uh, you can email me, cannabis101podcast at gmail.com. Or if you think you'd make a great guest on the program, I'd also love to hear from you. Really excited about hour two coming out on Wednesday. I've got Shabazz and Eric uh, who are from two different companies, Detonate and Dutchie, uh, but have come together uh, to form uh, Spiffy, with Spiffy, uh, an education platform. Uh, not only are we going to have a lot of fun with those two guys uh, and get some information, but we're going to do something a little bit different. These two guys are like the odd couple, so it should be entertaining. Uh, we'll also, of course, have Chris Ionson for What's That Strain? He's our educator and the manager of Nova Cannabis on Jasper Ave. Past episodes can be found at podcast or cannabis101podcast.ca. And if you're into more podcasts, check out podcastalley.ca, where I have a bunch of other shows as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. As we leave you, as we always do, it's the marijuana song from the artist My Dead Dog. Remember, it's not just about getting high, it's about getting healthy.